the theme of that song, Lay It Down, is what the theme of this talk is. There's something we're being called to lay down and do differently. But I want to talk about the end of the talk right now because I want to read you a poem that is going to talk about where we're going. This is a poem by Rumi. Rumi lived in uh, the 1200s. He is the best-selling author in the United States today, best-selling poet. He's got something going for him. <laughs> See if you can tell. Here it is. <clears throat> the minute I heard my first love story, I started looking for you, not knowing how blind that was. Lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. This is a love poem. But it's about the only really true love story. It's the love between you and God. The love between you and your source. This is what all poetry and all religion is about. All true religion is about learning more and more about love, learning to love more and more. Another poet from the Islamic tradition, Ibn Arabi, said this, my heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks and a temple for idols, and the pilgrim's Kaaba, and the tables of the Torah, and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that's my religion and my faith. To be engaged in spiritual living is to become a follower of the religion of love. Many of you may have heard the Dalai Lama, a Tibetan Buddhist, talking about my religion is kindness, same thing. To find love in all its forms, inside and outside, to find love in each other, that is what true religion is. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this particular tradition, said this, if you want to get the most out of your relationships, out of the relationships you live in, he said, we must sense that there is hidden within, around, and through each of us, a divine presence manifesting itself in infinite variations, but it's the same impulse, the same love and life, never quite alike in any two persons. That same impulse, that same love and life is what we are called to know, recognize, and follow. That is religious life. That is spiritual living. We are to feel the love in each other, we are to feel love in all things, but that's a little hard to do off the bat, I'd say. The Course in Miracles, a course in spiritual mind training, says this, really we can't teach you how to love, because love is what you are, but we can teach you how to remove the barriers to love's presence. And our book of the month this year uh, this month, is gives us some practices to remove those barriers. So, the first thing the book says is it's, there's something that's easier than loving, and it's blessing. And it primes the pump for love. You know how you prime a pump? If you go and you're in one of those old farm kitchens where there's a pump by the sink, if you've ever seen it, and nobody's pumped it in a while, what you have to do is pour water in first, so that it will bring water up from the well. Receive and give. That's what we have to do, is we have to prime the pump of love by, as this author suggests, blessing. And what blessing means, according to the author, is this. It means to, to bless people means to wish them well, to consciously will them happiness and freedom from suffering. This is the basis of so many spiritual traditions, so many healing traditions. Tibetan Buddhism, for instance, in Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, every time you meditate, every time you do an act of service, everything that you do, you dedicate 
any merit that might have come from it, any good that might have come from it, and you dedicate it, you say, I want this to go towards the liberation of all beings, the liberation from suffering. So that is the basis of their practice. Wishing, willing, blessing, the liberation from suffering of all beings. And one of the pioneering um, uh, people within the uh, counseling uh, world, Carl Rogers, taught that unconditional positive regard was necessary on the part of the therapist, on the part of the counselor, if real healing was to occur. That unconditional positive regard means that you prize your client, you wish them well, you're happy when they do well. You may not like what they do, you may not have it any way to appreciate the kinds of behavior they have, but them you appreciate. He, taunted, he sometimes called it grandmotherly mind. So, our book of the month is called Zen Commandments. And uh, the first thing the author says, which I, I'm grateful for, is he said, it's not about Zen and it's not about commandments. All right. You may have heard the joke in the Christian tradition that says, you know, God gave us ten commandments, not ten suggestions. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, these are the suggestions. Okay, so, because the book is Zen Commandments, and the subtitle is Suggestions for a Life of Inner Freedom. Freedom is powerful, powerful understanding. What we all seek is freedom within. Freedom to express ourselves, freedom to feel our feelings, freedom to be who we are. We want outer freedom, of course, but we want even more inner freedom. And so this path of blessing is in fact a path to freedom, a path to release from any confinement you may be experiencing and not even know that you're experiencing. As the author says, take the first step of blessing others and life, your life will change in inconceivable ways. So he begins to talk about what are the challenges to doing this? What are the challenges? The first challenge is this, a fear of selfishness. You know, uh, we often feel that uh, I know that if I bless people, I'll feel better. I know they'll feel better, my heart will be open, but you know, I'm actually doing it because I want to feel better. It's just that I want to feel better that I'm doing this. And people say, hmm, that's not really a great, you know, it's kind of selfish. But spiritual traditions from Shantideva on have said that no matter what you think your motive is, start acting, start blessing, start where you are. You may have various reasons to, uh, uh, th that are for your own benefit, but that doesn't take away from the merit and the benefit of what you're doing. I, at this point, I want to talk about, this talk is uh, talking about a phenomenon that I think many of us have experienced, which is we know it's good if we go take a walk or we go work out in a gym. We know that's better for us. We know we'll feel better. But in fact, do we do it? No. Well, this talk is going to take us a step deeper. Why is it that we don't do it even though we know it's better? Because we don't actually experience what's going on while we're not going to the gym, while we're not blessing. So we're going to focus in on that. So, first thing is, don't forget why, don't evaluate why you're doing it. Is it a good enough motive? No, it's because you want to feel better. That's great. That works well. So, to bless everyone, says the author, we don't have to first purge all our old grudges and hatreds or untangle all our old feelings. Thank God. <laughs> that would be backwards, he writes. Then no one would ever start. The process of blessing facilitates the untangling. I'm really noticing in this last five years, I'd say, maybe for a long time beyond that, my own tangled feelings. 
I mean, I'm really aware when I'm condemning somebody or obviously not blessing them. I'm aware when I'm attacking them. I may have great reasons, but I'm aware of that. But what I'm not noticing, what I'm not noticing is that I'm thinking not really bad thoughts about people, but kind of bad thoughts about people. <laughs> that guy's really not going to, you know, he's a loser. <laughs> or she's not going to amount to much. You fill in the blank. You are doing it, if you're like me, which I'm going to assume, throughout the day, as we stand in the social hall, as we look around the room, we're having subtle judgments about how people are and what they are. And what I'm not noticing is how I feel as I do that. What I'm doing with those thoughts, with those what the author calls anti-blessings, <laughs> what I'm doing is building a cage. I'm constricting my own being. And it's a cage where I'm surrounded by incompetent, incapable, unloving, and self-centered beings. <laughs> right? And then inside the cage, I don't feel loved, appreciated, or seen. Surprise, huh? The first step out is to notice the cage as it's being built. To begin the process of healing, a blessing, we don't need to do something. We need to stop doing what we have been doing. To recognize how it feels as we're doing these anti-blessings. What's going on as you're doing this? One thing to stop doing is resenting. And the author describes it this way. That almost irresistibly delicious bitterness over the success and happiness of others. Have you ever had a friend come in the room and say, oh, I just got that great new job and I'm going to be with this wonderful situation. And then somebody says, oh, I hate you. <laughs> right? Now, that's a joke, but there's something in it. There's something going on that is saying, mm, I'm not quite happy about this. I notice I get... Uh, unhappy when uh, I see people getting their good uh, is for instance if there's a team I'm, I'm a sports fan and if there's a team and they have somebody that I think uh, the coach is egotistical I root against that team <laughs> you know like they're just too you know I just don't like the kind of person they are I'll root I'm glad when they lose <laughs> do you get your happiness from watching others lose. Because that's the second thing. Pleasure from derived from the misery of others. You know, you've watched, the, many of you, of course, most of us have watched The Simpsons. But Nelson on The Simpsons is always going, ha ha. <laughs> you know, that bratty, ah. And I have really become aware of uh, how much I enjoy people getting their just desserts. <laughs> right? We're going, you know, we're entering a big political season for the next year. It's already started. But already I'm like, oh, boy, am I glad they're really screwing up. <laughs> you know, I'm really, it's my, it's just where it goes. And I'm noticing it as I read the papers. I look for stories about politicians or executives or um, um, performers, <clears throat> excuse me, all of them getting their comeuppance. Uh, by the way, this is one of those opportunities where we get to say, if we're in that position, I told you so. <laughs> you weren't paying attention. But there are more subtle forms. We have unwritten lists. These unwritten lists are anti-blessings like anybody who has withheld or withdrawn love from us, ex-romantic partners, perhaps parents. Just the thought of them triggers our, triggers our hostility. And then we have another unwritten list, which is all of those losers. They're not as cool or smart or attractive. They're not moral. They're not enlightened. It's easy to dismiss them. 
Oh, that fake, that nutcase, that ridiculous fashion casualty. <laughs> I'm reading. We say all of that, but it's at a price. What's happening at that point is we're closing our hearts to them. We're shutting ourselves down. We no longer are expanding. We're confining ourselves. We shrink inside as we think these thoughts. Now, the author says this, and I think it's good advice. Don't try to suppress these thoughts. But when they arise, notice, acknowledge that it merely poisons your heart and it does nothing to the people out there. So, notice that you are constructing a painful cage every time you do that. But more than discomfort, what you're doing is you're creating and living a lie. You're affirming a lie. There's a commandment in the Bible, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And that's not just about don't tell lies about your neighbor. It's don't tell lies about what you think your neighbor is. In other words, don't tell yourself lies about what and who that neighbor is. The author writes, the guy who smashes his empty beer bottle on my sidewalk <clears throat> has done something terrible. But as I sweep up the pieces, I'm bearing false witness if I mutter that he's a bum or a cad or a creep and so on through the dictionary. He is pure, radiant existence, just like me. He is that divine love and life that Ernest Holmes pointed to, just like me. And the more room I give him to be that, the more room I find for me to be that. The truth is, when we're living that lie, we're making up stories about each other. One of my favorite teachings comes from Mark Twain. He says, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> Most everything you know about anybody just ain't so. Acknowledging the pain we're in, acknowledging that this doesn't work, and laying it down, as John sang, is the first step into real freedom. So, we can begin to act in a different way. We can begin to now do exercises like this. We'll call it enlightened people watching. <laughs> Take a stroll. You may find yourself, like me, uh, automatically sizing people up. Seeing, um, as far as I can tell, the limits of their vision. And I'm now going to read from the book again. That lame-o suburban mom, that scary biker, they don't know the score. Of course, you're not seeing them at all, but judging them on the basis of the bodies and social roles in which they're dressed. The reality is that you have no idea what waves of boundless love the mom feels for her kids or what vistas of expansive silence the biker experiences when he's rolling down the highway. Simply notice your mind making these judgments and over and over again, let them go. Notice, feel the cage, let them go. Whenever a constricted stereotype, wherever it was, smash it open to reveal the space where anything is possible. You know, when we're blessing everyone, it doesn't mean that we're going to invite them into our house. It doesn't mean that we have to suddenly become uh, artificially friendly or so forth. Maybe we don't invite them to our table. Maybe, realistically, we're going to skip their parties or vote them out of office. Maybe in their blindness they've done things for which we must lock them in jail. But we can make the commitment to drop our scorn and stop locking them out of our hearts. We can start to invent our own ways of blessing people. Every time you hear a siren, remember that someone like you is right now needing your love and attention. Wish them the best. Make a habit of smiling and sharing a greeting with everybody you meet. Boss, employees, people who serve you your coffee or bag your groceries. And while the service rep has you on hold, 
or you're parked in the, or you're packed into a crowded elevator, or you're coming home on the freeway. Mentally shower everyone with your favorite blessing prayer, or if you dare, just smile at them. Or if you can, perceive them in the full blossoming of their natural divine glory. But you know, we find it hard to bless others for another reason, which is that our judgment of others is rooted in our own self-judgment. Remember the image of priming the pump. We have to be able to receive love in order to be give it out, to give it out, to receive blessing, to give it out. Uh, there's a phrase in Gaelic which means I love you, but literally it means I'm melting for you. Blessing might be said to melt the judgments we have of others. But we also have to melt the old ideas we have about ourselves. This is important. The only one who knows you, who knows those others as they actually are, is the one we call God. Is the one mind that lives in you right now. Is the one life, is the one heart. It knows you and it knows the others. We've got to let go of what just ain't so and let God tell us, show us who we are, who the other person is, and then teach that to each other. One of the fundamentals of spiritual practice is whatever you do to anyone or anything, you do to everyone and you do it to yourself. Ernest Holmes said this, we are members of the universe, and being that, members of that which unites everything, we are some part of each other. We are some part of each other. Everyone in this room is part of you. Everyone in this planet is part of you. Everyone in existence is part of you. Jesus talked about it in this way. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. What we're called to do is to no longer unconsciously curse ourselves under the guise of not blessing others. If we curse them, we curse ourselves. And in spiritual living, we're looking for God or spirit in everything and everyone. In fact, a way you could define love is this. Love is to see what is truly real about anyone. Love is to see what they actually are. When you do look at them as they are, you see the heart that lives in them. You see it's the same heart that lives in you. Every being in the world is moved by this same energy, this same heart, this same life. It's you living there. We always recognize love. But we don't always recognize that love is in us, always, at the very center of our being. And we tend to go out and look for it, and we forget the message of this poem. The minute I heard my first love story, I started looking for you, not knowing how blind that was. Lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. Please join me in prayer. This prayer is an acknowledgement of who it is that is listening. Within each person here right now, there is a place where this is being understood, where this is being responded to, where this is being felt, this being these words. That place in each one of us is God itself in action. It is the one mind living its life as each person here. Each person here is the full and complete expression of its being, consciously and deliberately chosen moment by moment, eternally. Each person here is the way in which God loves its life. It loves itself as it is being you. So I speak this word now for and about us. And I say that there is only this one living as us. Therefore, at the very center of our being, and there is nothing but the center of our being, 
There is only God. There is only love. There is only peace. There is only joy. And we now lay down any ideas or thoughts about what we have thought we have been, about the lies we have told ourselves. And we release any lies we are telling about anyone else, either major lies or subtle lies. And we begin to bless those in our world. And we begin to release and to melt those old ideas we have so firmly entrenched up until now. And we let in the possibility that God is the one who is acting. That God is alive as you, as me. It is this awareness that frees us. It is in this awareness that we are totally free. So I give thanks for it. And I simply release this word and allow it to be done by the one who does everything as each one of us. And so it is. Take a breath. <laughs>